All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator uh, here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And um, while we give everybody just a minute or two to come find us from the various corners of the internet, I'll do a couple of real quick, quick brief store announcements before we bring Nick and Don out to get things started tonight. So first up, thank you for joining us this evening. We're so excited to be able to um, have uh, Don Bentley and Nick Petrie back with us. Wanted to mention we haven't seen too many issues lately, but for a while we were seeing some spammers pop up. So if you see any links asking you to click away from the event so that way you can input your info and watch it somewhere else, definitely don't do that. All of the um, stuff that you're watching is here live. You don't have to click anywhere else. You don't have to give anybody your uh, credit card info to watch that. If anything pops up, I will definitely delete it um, as fast as I can. And I just saw a comment from Aaron. Uh, hi, Aaron. It's nice to see you. Uh, Aaron is one of the publicists at Berkeley, so we're excited to see that she is watching with us. So like Aaron, if you guys are watching, if you have questions for either of the authors, you can pop those in the comments. After they've chatted for a little bit, we'll leave some time at the end uh, for crowd Q&A. So definitely post those questions in there. Wanted to mention if you have not been in the store for a while, we are open for browsing. We know not everybody is getting out and about in the world. So if you still prefer curbside pickup, you can give us a call or order online and we can um, get the book set outside for you. We're also still offering free media mail on orders over $75. Um, we are still requiring masks in the store and we're still limiting it to six people at a time. So if you pull up and the parking lot's full, maybe just poke your head and see where we're at capacity wise and we'll let you know whether um, you can come in or whether or not we need you to wait few minutes. Uh, last thing I'm going to mention, um, on Thursday, March 18th, we're super excited. We're going to be um, doing a live virtual event with um, Harlan Coben, who's going to be in conversation with Michael J. Fox. We're super excited about this. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you can visit the website and you can find out all about that. But I'm going to get us started tonight. Tonight, we are here to celebrate The Outside Man, which is uh, Don Bentley's newest book in his series. So we're going to bring him in. How are you tonight, Don? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks for for joining us again. Congrats on the release of the new book. Thank you. Thank you. So for you, for anyone watching who is not familiar, uh, Don Bentley spent a decade as an Army Apache helicopter pilot, and while deployed in Afghanistan, was awarded the Bronze Star Medal and the Air Medal with V device for valor. Following his time in the military, Don worked as an FBI special agent focusing on foreign intelligence and counterintelligence and was a special weapons and tactics team member. Some of you might have caught our event um, earlier this year with um, Don where he was interviewing Nick Petrie about his new book. Um, so tonight we're flipping this with the script. So tonight Nick's going to get to harass Don a little bit. So we're going to bring Nick out. How are you tonight, Nick? I'm great. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us. Oh, my pleasure. So I'm sure if any of you guys have been following either of them on Twitter, you know that you're in for, for a treat tonight. So uh, <laughs> Nick's newest book is The Breaker, which just came out in January. Uh, he is the author of five novels in the Peter Ash series, most recently The Wild One. So clearly I did not up bio since the last one. Um, his debut, The Drifter, won both the ITW Thriller Award and the Barry Award for Best First Novel and was a finalist for the Edgar and Hammett Awards, husband and father who lives in Milwaukee. Um, and I wanted to mention we have um, signed book plates for both books. So if you um, want either one, you can visit um, murderbooks.com. I will drop a link in the comment um, where you can order those. So guys, I'm going to let you get to it. I will see you in a little bit. Uh, we'll last once mention one more time. If anybody has questions for the authors, please feel free to drop those in the comments and we'll get to them. So I will see y'all in a few minutes. Have fun. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, well, hey, dude, how are you? You know, I'm pretty good and, and I'm very thankful you're here, but Harlan Coben got Michael J. Fox. That's all I'm saying right now. I, I am no I Michael mean, J. Fox, but, but you are no Harlan Coben. Let me just point that out, all right? <laughs> touche, touche, <laughs> my friend. Well, I, I have been having fun with you on Twitter, and I, I said earlier that I was I was going to call you a tofu eater, but I thought that might be uh, going a little too far because you know you the whole Texas thing. It is not too far. I actually out of flight school, my first two years I spent in uh, South Korea and got to be a tofu eater there. There you go. And our mutual friend Bill Schweigart, his lovely wife Kate Schweigart, once substituted tofu for meat and did not tell me. And so I became a de facto mm. tofu eater that night. Well, that doesn't really say much about you that you couldn't tell the difference. Or actually, <laughs> maybe it says something good about Kate because the, mm -hmm. the, although 
Kate doesn't see this. Because you were just about to go that her cooking, I couldn't tell the difference between meat and tofu, aren't you, Petrie? Like, I, well, I but see she doesn't where you seem were going. like the kind of person to to try to change tofu into meat anyway, right? So, you better, anyway, yeah, I, I, I better, I better, I better right talk now. myself That's out of this. Saying. Yeah, oh crap, Kate, no, shoot. All right, uh, so anyway, so the outside man. Uh, is your second Matt Drake novel? We might as well just get into this because you and I could, you know, do this yes, yes. all week. Um, so Matt is kind of a kind of a damaged soul. I mean, he's a he's a he's a cheerful guy. He's a can do guy, but he's he's pretty messed up. Um, so you know, why was that piece important to you? And and tell us a little bit about, yeah. about who Matt is and, and and why he's your guy. Sure. So um, I have to, since this is our first interview together, uh, Mr. Petrie, I have to let you know that when I hear something wise and I can't remember who says it, I normally attribute it to either my editor, Tom Colgan, or my mentor, Nick Petrie. So Nick Petrie once told me that in a, in a really good book, the writer is kind of answering a question for themselves in, in the pages of that novel. And so with Matt Drake, I really wanted to bring some of my experiences um, to the writing. And, and that was another one. And I'll give Tom Colgan credit for this is, is that whole idea of when you're new to this genre, you know, you're a fantastic writer. Greg Hurwitz is a fantastic writer. Brad Taylor's a fantastic writer. There are a lot of fantastic writers here and, and you already write the best Nick Petrie book around. And so nobody needs me to come and try and write a Nick Petrie book. So what I, what I have to do or what any aspiring writer that wants to move into this genre has to do is figure out a way to do something same but different. And so same in that hopefully your book belongs on the shelf none, next to some of those great writers, but different in that what you're bringing isn't the same as what's already out there. And so for me, one of the ways I did that was putting Matt and Drake together and in making Matt have to deal with some of the things I did, dealt with. So I spent 10 years as an Army Apache pilot and, and flying an Apache is, is maybe the one of the greatest jobs in the world because they actually pay you to do it and you still get to fly this Apache around. But in when I was deployed into Afghanistan, um, we had a, an operation that went tragically wrong and it kind of profoundly affected me and affected my life. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out there was a moment in time where things went sideways and I couldn't stop it. And so you naturally have that feeling of how do I get this moment in time back? How do I atone for it? Is there a way? What does that mean for the rest of my life? And so I really put those questions down on the page and without sanction. And that's what Matt has to deal with there. And the book is meant to be, and hopefully it comes across this way, very much a tale of redemption in that, in that you can't get that moment in time back again, but you still can find meaning for your life. And so that was kind of part of the art for without sanction. In the outside man, I kind of delved into a second part that I went through in that a lot of folks when they're in the military or perhaps in law enforcement or first responder or something like that, you have this notion that um, what you're a part of is something bigger than yourself, that it's that it's noble, that it's this sense of purpose. And when you leave that, you end up leaving that behind and you also leave a good portion of yourself behind because you, you don't realize at the time how much of who you are is tied up in what you do. And so when I left the army after 10 years, I remember um, my mom telling me or my mom asking me at the time and she said, you know, I, I got this great job. My wife and I were high school sweethearts. So we were moving back to where we were both from. Our families were there. And I remember my mom saying to me as I was in the middle of the transition, she's like, well, what if you don't like it? And, you know, I, I kind of laughed it off and I said, you know what? I, I just spent a year in Afghanistan. Like, I, I'm not sure how anything over here can compare to anything like that. And it, and it didn't, but I had this incredible sense of dissonance in that everything, everything that I was trying to sort through, everything around my identity of who I was or what mattered, I was going through by myself in some way because everybody who could understand that were people I served with and I was separate from them now. And so you're trying to process that on your own and work your way through it. And I just remember, you know, two or two and a half or years or so into it, waking up one day and thinking, everybody here is happy. Like my kids are happy. My wife is happy. Our family's happy. I have this great job. I live in a great house. We go to a great church but I'm not happy. And I can't even tell you why. And I know I should be, but I'm not. And, and it's, 
it and it was again kind of tied back to that that sense of purpose or that meaning. And so when the outside man starts, that's coincidentally exactly where we find Matt Drake in that at the end of Without Sanction, he resigned his position in, in the Defense Intelligence Agency. He and his wife have moved back to Austin, which they both love, and are living a life which should be on its surface great, that everything should be fantastic, that he should be happy and he's not, and he can't figure out why. And not only can he not figure it out himself, but he can't figure out a way to articulate it to his wife, who's his best friend, who he should be able to do it. And, and it's not from a lack of trying. It's because he doesn't have the words to be able to say that. And so, again, taking my great friend Nick Petrie's advice is answering a question for yourself in the book or maybe taking a step further, being brave enough to put in a book about the things that you're afraid of or the things that you scared, you're scared to deal with. That's where kind of the where without sanction starts, or excuse me, where the outside man starts. Well, and that's where that's where all of the emotion comes from. I mean, it, it, in, unless mm -hmm. you're a good enough writer to be able to just pull it out of thin air, um, yep. you know, I all of the emotion and I think great writers got to come from someplace. And yep. if you can if you can find a way to, to tap tap into what what's in you, the, the yep. writing is is so much more powerful. And and again, I, you've totally yep. done that. I think in both of these books. Well, I appreciate that. And I want you to talk because you and I have talked about this a little bit. And, and and this is super fascinating to me is that you wrote Peter Ash as a as a veteran. And he has a, a similar thing that he deals with. And you're not a veteran and you you don't suffer from PTSD, but you still figured out a way to channel that and channel it so effectively across the five books. So that, what did you draw upon to make Peter Ash real? Well, in the uh, first, let me just say that I appreciate you calling me your mentor. Um, I really prefer <laughs> I prefer guru. Um, so just in the future, just kind of Petri guru. That's that's what I'm going. Out of your sensei. Yeah, uh, yeah, or sensei. I, I would I would live with that. Not that I not that I have any physical skills whatsoever. Um, but well, you know, we. I mean, you know, I I never thought of myself as. I mean, again, I'm not a veteran. I, I don't have post traumatic stress, and I, I I never thought of myself who was. Uh, somebody who was, you know, subject to panic attacks or particularly anxious about mm -hmm. about any of that stuff, but but diving into post traumatic stress and sort of the the many 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 different ways that that manifests. I mean, there it's yeah. it's really uh, it's really unique to every person who who has to deal with it. Um, there are yeah. some some commonalities, and and one of the things that that often happens is it sort of builds into sort into a panic attack, and mm -hmm. and and I have had enough. Uh, you know, kind of moments of stress in my life. And I've, I've been self-employed since I was 22 years old. There's, there's been plenty of moments of panic in that, um, you know, being a, <laughs> being a, being a father, uh, you know, all mm -hmm. of those things. So, so kind of finding those, those parts in myself. And I, and I, I didn't honestly did, you know, for, it, for you, it sounds like this is sort of a conscious process for me. Yeah. I kind of, I, I sort of, th this character grew organically mm -hmm. as I wrote that first book and I got to the end of it and I sort of, Actually, even at the end of that first book, I didn't really realize how much of myself was in it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and and now I know that that again, it's not something I, I think about really or plan, but but mm -hmm. at the end of, of 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 all of these books, there's something I'm trying to work out. There's some yep. Yep. You, you know, it's it's there's a, a, a piece of my relationship with my wife, or it's some yep. way that I interact with the world, or something deeply internal. Um yep. and again it to, you know, the key to, you know, we, people think of thrillers as being, uh, you know, fast and, and action packed yeah. and, and, and full of, you know, adventure. And, 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 you know, if we're lucky, if we're good at what we do, they, they are, but without the emotion, yeah. without, yeah, right. without, you know, if you don't care about the character, if, if that emotion right. doesn't transmit, you're, you're, you're not doing your job and they might as well be you know, puppets, they might as well be, yep. you know, Lego figures that you're posing on a, a, a you know, on your desk. Yep. Um, that's um, good. Yeah. But again, just, you know, in the future, yeah, guru, I like guru. That sounds good. <laughs> uh, well, so again, so, so, so back to the outside man, right? So, so mm -hmm. this, this book is just so full of story. I mean, that was the thing that really struck me is, is that Thank you. Um, like there's enough here for two or three books. So was that, and 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 again, the um, without sanction was not a slow book, but it was yeah. it, it was it was different. Um, yeah. 
And so is that was was that intentional on your part? Was it uh, you, you feel like that was that was sort of Tom's influence, Tom Colgan, who is your editor, who I'm sure isn't watching. Who um, I also but have we, to we should talk about him. Instantly enough, yes, yeah, Guru yeah. Tom Tom Colgan yeah, is what he prefers. Um, no, so I, I'm one of those nutcases, and for everybody else um, watching, I call Nick Petrie pretty frequently and and express my woes as a writer, and and he's kind enough to listen to me, and so it's one of the great buddy. <laughs> One of the great pieces of advice that he gave me that I firmly um, disregarded was don't read your reviews. And so I actually do did read quite a few of my reviews to the point where I'd find the really horrible ones and show them to my wife. And I'm like, look how much effort this person put into hating me. Like there's mm -hmm. so much here mm -hmm. that they hate me. But I think in, in all seriousness, like it, you know, even the good reviews are and there are lots of great reviews for without sanction. They were, you know, you're reading and you're like, and, and you want to understand from as a writer, when did it get to the point for readers where they couldn't put the book down, where it was like, holy crap, like I'm hooked in. I can't, I can't put this down if I wanted to. I just burned dinner or whatever. And so a lot of what kind of the feedback I got for Without Sanction is there's a, there's a point in the book where Matt does this hey ho insertion and he's in Syria and, and trying to do things. And they're like, Hey, from that on, like I couldn't put the book down. And so I thought about that a lot and thought, you know, for the outside man, is there a way that I could pull that forward? Is there a way to, to try and, you know, punch the reader in the face earlier um, and, and, and keep that intensity, but it's a super, super hard line to walk because what you can't have is dramatic event to dramatic event to dramatic event because it loses all of its emphasis, right? And you burn the reader out. It's like they get adrenal fatigue there because all you're doing is gunfights. All you're doing is things. And so, I, but I do, I did consciously try to say, how can I pull some of that forward? How can I amp the tension up earlier? How can I do some of the things that folks really liked about without sanction but maybe do it faster in the outside man. And, and Tom Colgan is a great editor um, and, and super encouraging, super very much collaborative to work with. But I remember when we had our editorial call for the outside man, he's like, I didn't think you could, but, but this seemed even faster than without sanction. Like, how did you do that? And so that was where I was like, okay, okay. I tried something new. I, I went out of my comfort zone. I, I, I took a bigger swing and, and maybe it paid off or at least, Guru Tom Colgan thought it paid off, so I appreciate you saying that. Well, it's it's interesting because um, I don't know, right? You you you. I mean, we've all read those books where yep. it's it's relentless and it's nonstop, but it's also yep. exhausting and no fun. Exactly and you, right. And and you you need that sort of tension and release and tension and yep. release. Um, it, the other thing that I always am amazed about talking with you whenever we have our conversations is how um, you think about this in a very different way than I do. I, I am, for me, mm -hmm. it's all kind of instinct and you are much more yep. analytical um, in your, in your process, um, which is, and again, I, you can't argue with the results. So. Well, I appreciate that. I think, I think, um, so all of us as, as writers have things that we do, um, better and things that we don't do. You're you're a very instinctual writer, and you know, you know, we've talked about this before. Like your command of language is fantastic. Like you do things because you've done it so much. You have an an MFA, and you're you know in, instinctively where to move. I do a very I'm more clinical about it. I think in that I write a rough draft, and and I keep trying to surprise myself as I'm writing the rough draft. But then when I go back, I lay on top of it the beats from the book Save the Cat that says, hey, in the first act, here's what's supposed to happen, the second act. And for me, what that allows me to do is say, hey, I went too far along here. The inciting incident doesn't happen fast enough. Or And it starts me, like I said, I don't, I don't outline, but I can use those beats to start thinking about because I know in at the end of act two, there's the dark night of the soul and all is lost, right? And so in my head, I'm thinking those two events, so it goes all is lost and then dark night of the soul are, are the two worst events in the book. And so I can think about where I am now 
and then think about what's even worse than that. What's exponentially worse than that. And I know that's what I'm steering to, right. Is that is those two points. And I think the other thing I do part of, part of my MFA program is we talk about close reading, right? So, so you read a book the first time and enjoy it as a reader. And then if you can like take exactly that same book and reread it and then read it as a writer and, and say, what did they do? What what are the micro tension things that they do? How did they increase the stakes? I think last time you and I were talking, we were talking about books. And one of my favorite um, is Jim Butcher and his book, Peace Talks, like every single chapter is relentless, but it's not, it's like he cranks it just a little bit more and just a little bit. It's like that spring that's slowly right. tightening. So right. it's not what you're talking about where the spring's going back and forth and you're getting whiplash but he's doing it slightly more every single chapter so that when he takes you, you know, to the, um, to the uh, dark night of the soul or whatever it is, and it breaks and you're like, holy crap, like I've been under so much pressure. And so you feel that incremental slow build and that release at right. the end of it right. rather than kind of the whiplash thing. And so I have to, I do have to study that more. I have to look at my pacing and be more deliberate and say, what am I leading up to? And another great one in those that I love is he is the, the Save the Cat again. They talk about the midpoint, right? So the midpoint is the false um, salvation, or it can be the inverse is, you know, the false failure. And for mine, it's usually the false salvation. And so, you know, you're building to that and you're like, this is the point where it looks like everything's going to be all right. And it's not, but, but it helps you guide right on that arc and like, okay, it's worse, worse, worse. Okay, it looks like it's going to be okay. And that's another natural point where you can decrease the tension slightly, you know, and it gives the reader time to breathe. But then, you know, bam, you're going to hit them as you roll into to um, act, act two, the second so, part of act two. So, so you're sort of hanging all of this on on mm -hmm. this theoretical scaffolding of, yeah, kind, of, yeah, of yeah. kind of how you your idea of how a story should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, well, actually, I want to backtrack a I minute. Mean, the the the. I actually, nobody taught me to to do this thing where you read a book twice. I actually had to figure mm -hmm. that out for myself. Um, but I actually added this, uh, another wrinkle. It's that when you read it the second time, write an outline mm -hmm. or, or write yep. a beat line of it, because then you, yep. then you really have to see it. And, yep. and you, and you can, you can go back and say, boy, you know, he went six chapters between Absolutely. seeing, you know, character X, you know, between the, the times when you got to see character X and that didn't seem like any time at all. So it really lets you see yep. like what you can get away with, what you can't get away with. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you're like me, we're, we, you know, you worry, I worry a lot in the course of writing a book, like, yep. you know, am I giving away too much? Am I not giving away enough? Have I, have I pushed this too far? Have I not, you know, that yep. tension release thing, right? So for me, it's sort of yep. like the stock exchange zigzag, right? Yeah, you always want to go higher up. Um, but absolutely. so, you know, is it, you know, am I, am I too long between peaks, you know, and, and, and taking yep. apart a book that you really love really yep. helps you see the mechanics of it. And, and, yep. you know, whether you, you're, I mean, you're, you're using the model in save the cat, which is a great model. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but you can also really build your own model and build your own yep. calibrations. If you do that with enough books, you know, you, yep. you know, the, the, you know, this, you become the scaffolding. Um, yeah, that's and, and that's, and I think that's kind of part of how I do it is I just, I, and that's where that instinct piece comes from. Um, yeah. I had this, I had this conversation with Greg Hurwitz, um, where he said, you know, everybody wants to know, like, what is the book to read to teach them how to write? And he said, there isn't one, there's 2000 of them and you got to read them all. <laughs> and I just, I love that. I love that. I can't no, that's tell you. Absolutely right. You know, we meet writers who uh, haven't quite gotten where they want to get to, and 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 they're always yeah. the ones who say, "Yeah, I don't really read; I just write." And it's like that is not how you learn how to write. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I told you know this story a little bit in one of the other interviews. But when you you were like me in that you wrote several books that didn't sell before you wrote The Drifter that did, and I wrote three books that didn't sell as well before I wrote Without Sanction that did, and so. Maybe between book two and three, I, I was doing a lot of, of reflection and saying, what, what am I doing wrong? Because obviously doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results right. is insanity. And my favorite book um, in this genre or my favorite writer um, was Vince Flynn. And, and Kyle Mills does a fantastic job now. But Vince Flynn was just phenomenal. And, and my favorite book in his series was Protect and Defend. 
And so I literally took index cards and I had one color was all the Mitch Rapp scenes. One color was all the antagonist scenes. One color was all the other POV ones. And I put it on my bedroom wall because we lived in a small house. And so I could literally step back from the wall, much to my wife's chagrin, and see how he built that book, like what the scaffolding was. And it was exactly what you're saying. I was like, oh, he never goes more than two chapters or whatever it was before right. circling back to the protagonist again. Right. Or, oh, here, and I would do, I'd put little symbols, like I'd star, here's a fight scene, here's a gun. And then you can see how he does the pacing and right. stuff, right? right? And that's the part of writing where I think you have to, if you want it from a craft perspective, you have to be willing to deconstruct how the masters do things and say, because then it's like, like what you're saying, it's kind of like, you know, the veil parts and you're like, Oh, I see how they, now I can't like one of my other favorite writers too is Daniel Silva. And he's, he's a lot like you in, in the fact that language is very, very important to him. And there are things that, that, you know, he almost, he almost rides that line between literary and commercial fiction. And it's very, very beautiful writing, but it's also, you know, has a has a plot that moves and and some of the aspects of commercial fiction but i can read something that he did and i was like i kind of see what he did there i don't know if i could do that but i can kind of see what he did and and you got to do that too with the books like i said like the vince flynn one for me or what you're talking about as an outline because then it takes some of the magic off of it, right? And you're like, okay, now I'm looking under the hood and I can see more of the mechanics of it. Well, and, it and I, yeah, no, I was also going to say, like, it's important to read above yourself, right? If you never yes, read anybody yes. who's better than you, you're never going to learn to write better yes. than you write. I mean, if all you read are romance novels, all you're going to write is porn. Yes. I don't know what that, you That's not said, from personal yes. experience. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, but. I think the other thing I'd say is that one of, so one of our, this was another aha moment for me. One of our good friends is John Dixon, who's a, a fantastic writer too. And he and I were in the same MFA program and he was, we were critique partners straight out of the program. And it was fantastic because he was much more accomplished writer than I was. Fantastic short story guy. His debut novel got made into a TV show and everything. But one of the things he was reading my early stuff and he's like, hey, this is real good. But he's like, what you're missing is that your protagonist needs to fail forward. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, you got to like if you look at a short story structure or apply it to a novel, your protagonist needs to be out doing things constantly, but they're not working. And, and that's part of yeah. the tension of the story. Right. Your protagonist is being aggressive, but none of it is working. And so the readers work, you know, rooting for him. And. Tom, um, I just turned in my first, the Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan Jr. novel and, and um, Tom was, Tom Colgan, my editor was, was awesome about it. And he said, you know, one of the things I love about your writing is your protagonist takes one step forward and two steps back every time that they do it. And that was like John Dixon, your protagonist has to fail forward because right. it's, I think too many folks, you have protagonists that are passive and readers don't want to read that. And then the other stretch is your protagonist, everything they do immediately turns out well. And and I think it was um, – um, man, I'm forgetting the agent now who wrote all the, the series of books. But um, one of his – he talked about micro tensions and stuff, right? So you have, you have macro tensions, which here's the situation that I'm trying to resolve. A micro tension thing is I can't find my keys in the first place that I look for it, right? And so it's very, it's subtle. It's something that the reader probably doesn't notice as they're doing it, but it registers in their mind that all is not well for this protagonist, right? That they're struggling to do something. And so those I think are some of the like under the hood things that you can pick up on writing. But you, to your point, I always kind of shudder inside too when people are like, ah, I don't really read. I just write. And I was like, well, you know, maybe that works for you and you're a super, super gifted writer, but I got to read all the time because I'm always trying to deconstruct what the people better than me are doing and figuring out how they did it. And then hopefully trying to pull some of that into my own writing. Right. Well, so we're, we're I mean, we're a, we're a little uh, kind of wonky writery here. Um, but while, <laughs> while, we're, while we're on this, um, you know, my my MFA program. So I, I went to a, a, a program that uh, where genre writing was really, you know, not respected in any way at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was, you yeah. know, you were, if you weren't writing, you know, highbrow literary stuff, you know, you're, you know, you don't belong here. 
Um, yep. at, at one point, my my advisor said to me, um, you write the kind of stuff that people will actually read. And it was not intended as a compliment. <laughs> uh, so that was my experience with, with Hannah. And, and I, I wasn't, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I when I was 18, I wanted to be Ernest Hemingway, right? You know, then I wanted mm -hmm. to be Jim yeah. Harrison. Then I wanted to be Cormac McCarthy. I, I like, I, I like, I like literary fiction where there's actually a story, where yep. there's and and there's real risk and there's real yep. uh, consequence. Um, but there's not a lot of that. But it sounds yep. like you got something very very different from Seton, Seton Hall, right? Seton Hill. So Seton, Seton, Seton Hall is the big school. Seton Hill is the little one in Pennsylvania. But yeah, and that's what drew um, drew me to it. Is it is unabashedly a genre focused MFA program, and so. When you come in and, and you, you do your writing samples and everything to be admitted, you, you tell them what genre you want to write under. And, the, and your thesis advisor, your mentor, is a, is a published author in that genre. And so you track along the genre that you want to read in. And then they actually have what they call cross-genre reading. So, you, so every time um, when you have the reading before you come into residency – the romance folks pick books one one time, the horror folks pick another time, the science fiction book. And so you're getting exposed to all this mainstream fiction that's outside of what you want to write. And then they bring in like fantastic guest speakers and stuff. They had Jonathan Mayberry in, they've had Sof Sophie Littlefield in, they've had all kinds of great writers from different genres who are writing commercial fiction. And so it's it's a very different program. But what I loved about it, like I said, was it was unabashedly focused on commercial fiction. Like you are coming here because you want to be a writer of commercial fiction. And it, it was a great program. But they, but they actually taught you useful skills. I'm not sure I learned yeah. any useful skills in mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's uh, step back again here. Um, you know, John gave us a bit of uh, kind of your background between Apache helicopters, mm -hmm. uh, the FBI, FBI SWAT, um, and now um, I, you're working for a defense contractor. Any anything in there would provide lots of material for a, for a thriller, but instead you're writing uh, about a spy. And is it just because mm -hmm. is it just because helicopter pilots aren't very cool? I mean, is that is like that's what started here? That's exactly why. Why, why, why that, a spy? Why a spy? That is, man, man. You, if you decide to give up writing, you could be a psychologist and just just <laughs> lie because you reached into my mind and pulled that out right there. I know, super perceptive. <laughs> I think what I what I like to say, to folks, is that um, I've done some interesting things in my background, and there are portions of it that certainly apply to my writing. Like when I was an FBI agent, I was what was called. Uh, a human guy. And so I was, my job was to run and recruit what we call sources or what folks in the intelligence community call assets. And so Matt does that same job, but he does it for the DIA, which is a member of the intelligence community. And he does it overseas where I would have done it here in the United States. Having said that, what I always tell folks is like the, the benefit of my background isn't that I got to do really cool stuff. It was that I got to meet people who did really cool stuff. And so for the outside man, I had somebody I met who did a job like Matt's overseas and he would, you know, he, he and I were talking one time and, and sometimes those folks operate under legends and, and um, which are, you know, kind of assumed names and such. And, and the reason behind all that is because you want to leave that behind when you come back home, right? That you're isolating everything that's important here to you from that very crazy thing that you do over there. And, and he told me, you know, as he was as recounting something that this this almost visceral reaction he would have when he would step off the plane back onto American soil. Like it was he could finally breathe again or he had this huge exhale that, OK, I did what I had to over here, but I'm now back on U.S. soil. And every everything I actually care about in my life is right here. And I've left all that bad stuff apart. And there's an ocean that separates us and all of this other crazy security stuff. So in my head, I thought, huh. That's kind of interesting. Like, I wonder what would happen if all that bad stuff did follow you back home. And then that kind of started me thinking, what are the things that would have to go wrong to allow that to happen, right? Because there are all these different protocols and things to do that, to keep that. And so that's how the outside man kind of kicks off is that Matt is back in Austin 
with his wife where everything is supposed to be great and that world that should be separate from him by an ocean and all kinds of security protocols somehow follows him home. And that's how the book starts. And he's got to figure out why and, and then and figure out why and how and then what he has to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, there, there is a bunch of helicopter stuff in this, uh, which I was <laughs> nice to see because I don't think there was really any. Oh, have I lost you? Am I frozen or are you frozen? No, I'm here. Can you All hear right. me? Oh, yeah, I got you. Yeah, it was nice to see some helicopter stuff because there wasn't really any in the last. And I was like, so I want to I want to see that part of your life because, you know, as as your friend, like I want to I want to kind of see some of that. So it was really fun to kind of have some of those scenes. Yeah. Uh, in this one. Yeah, yeah it, it is fun. And you um, I, I'm always careful with that. I think, well, for one thing. When I and another another reason to read, right, is because I think as a writer, Part of what we do is what we want to do and the story we want to tell. And then part of it is you're satisfying what reader expectations are, right? What does a reader want when they pick up a Nick Petrie book? And so for I me, tried, I, I tried hard not to think about that, though. Did you? Yeah, I, I see, find I, that totally paralyzing. <laughs> see, I think I, I think I, I guess maybe I should reframe it. What I try and go back to is what I loved when it was 14 year old me who first found this yeah. genre and these are the things that really jazzed me about it. Right. And so I, I say all the time that Tom Clancy was kind of my gateway drug to this genre. And what Tom was famous for are these, so you'd have a very um, tight story told about one protagonist, but then you'd also have, you know, F 14 strafing Russian tankers and you'd have, you know, submarine battles and ships doing stuff. And so, you got to see get the point of view of of the pilot of the F fourteen exactly and the commander exactly of the right. submarine and yeah exactly right and so I try and bring some of that to my books but I'm also careful when I was talking with Brad on um, Monday or Tuesday he was talking about how easy it is to default into what you're most comfortable to do and and when I talked to Mark yesterday Mark Graney he said you know you, what you have to watch is you can have four gunfights in a book, but each one better be different. It better not be repetitive. It better not. And so that's part of the thing I'm, I try to be very careful is it's very easy for me to write about helicopters. And I love doing that, but I want to be careful that I'm not doing it just because I love it or that I'm doing it the same way or that I did. And so it certainly there is more of that in the outside man. And it was super fun to write, but it's also something that I got to make sure I don't devolve to every time because it's very comfortable and easy to do. If that well, makes yeah, sense. Well, and, yeah, and and back to Mark Graney's point, um, you know, not only should those four gunfights be different, they should also be different from every gunfight you've ever done in the whole series. Yep. I mean, there yep. is there is this. I mean, this is part of the sort of the reader expectation piece that that's a challenge for me. Is you know, you start to you you, you know the more the more books in the series, the more you start to sort of yeah sort of see what your defaults are and trying to reach outside those uh, gets mm -hmm. harder and harder because, well, I've done this and I've done that. And yep. Yep. Um, so it's a, it, it's a, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting process. Um, so, so in terms of that, of that research, so do mm -hmm. you, do you, I'm always interested in this, in, in how, how writers approach this. Do you, do you start with sort of the research stuff? Do you, do you go, do you, do you research, you, do you, you have an idea and you kind of work your way through and you say, whoops, I need to know something about this. Um, yeah. Or do you ever get burdened down by the amount of research you're, you've done? Oh, I got to fit this in. Oh, I got to put that in. Yeah. So when I was, when I first was starting out writing, I thought I needed to have all of that nailed in the first draft. Right. And it's also, it's also an awesome way to get out of writing is oh, I, I really need to research what this is called or something. I better go on and a trip so, and find a friend. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so a couple of books ago, or maybe without sanctions, when I first started doing this, I would force myself, I'd just put XX. And so I would, or, you know, some people do TK or something like that. And you just keep going. If I don't know something, if I don't know what it is, I just put XX and I keep going and I can, cause you can search for XX after now. In, in the Clancy one, I put a little too many XXs and I got to that part of the draft and there were like 5,000. It wasn't that many, but I'm like, oh, for the love of God, like I never want to see another X. And so that's for, but that's more for the tactical thing. Like, is it, what kind of car is it in Syria? What does this, for the more strategic, like what binds the story together? 
I do a lot of um, kind of a voracious consumer of news, of different magazines, of articles. And so I keep a research file in my email all the time or just a research folder. And when I read something, it kind of pings. And I don't know, I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. I'll throw it in the research folder. And so oftentimes what I'll do is just take stake of that. And I'll write out or type out on a sheet of paper, here are all the things that are interesting in my research folder. Do any of these ping something again, right, as I'm working? And so that's how it kind of works for me where I um, combine the two. Like I was, I was talking to Mark um, Graining yesterday, and he's super, super an analytical guy where – he knows I'm going to write about this particular thing. So I'm going to research this and this and this and this. And I do it. I, I don't think I'm disciplined to do that because again, for me, it becomes a convenient excuse not to, to write, right? Like I'm going to do something about China. So I'm going to read all of the volumes of Chinese history for the last, you know what I mean? And yeah. so, so I'm like, whoo, I'd love to write today, but I'm all researched out. And so I think, you know, there's some folks who love that and are very, very good at it. I, I do probably the minimum amount I can or have to because I'm going to focus on the story and I'm going to use the research to try and bolster aspects of the story. But I'm not I'm not like Mark. One of Mark's books is um, I think one of his Clancy books was about this data breach um, when the Chinese hacked into the it's called the OPM, the author. I think it's OPM. Anyway, it's everybody who has a clearance. And this was a real deal that actually happened. Anybody in the U.S. who has a clearance, all of your information is stored in this one agency, right? And, and you can see how this might be rife for trouble. And, and so the Chinese actually went in, hacked it, and got all of those names and all that information. And so he wrote a whole book about that and researched it and how it could be done and everything. For me, that would be like an XX somewhere in chapter 47. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a place where all the names are stored <laughs> that have security, you know, and then you yeah. go back and do it. So. That's how it works for me. I mean, I guess you have some very, especially in um, in the breaker, you have a whole lot of technology, and some of some of the agencies you mentioned, I actually recognized from my my day job and stuff. And so, did you set out when you were when you were writing that? Did you set out and say, "I'm going to do a whole bunch of research first, or did you write it and say, "There's bound to be an agency that does this, and I'll just figure it out later? No, it's funny. So, so the a lot of the things in that book came from stuff I had read years ago. Um, for mm -hmm. me, research. I, you might, Margaret, my wife, refers to me as the veritable font of useless knowledge. So <laughs> I will, I will read something, and it will just sort of stick up here. I mean, I do have a folder where I, you know, I'm tearing out articles, mm -hmm. and I'm, um, I have a physical folder, and I have, uh, I, I, have I have links that I keep as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, but for me, it's it's more like. I, I'm 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 working on the book and something pops up and I'll say, yeah. Do I know something about this? Maybe yeah. I do know something about this, or or it'll just be like I'll have. There's just sort of stuff that's you know cooking around where, mm -hmm. um, you know I just like well that'll show up somewhere. Like I know that's going to be in something. Um, yep. so it's it's not yep. you know you I feel like you're kind of in the middle, but I mean you know Mark's at one end and I'm at the other mm -hmm. end, and you're kind of in the middle of that and, and uh, kind of much more deliberate. Uh, in your in your functionality than, than I am, yeah, um, yeah, that's probably fair. So, but it's it, yeah, it's it's uh, it's easy to find ways to waste time. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, so actually, so that's a that's a. Where's my other question? I had this. I had this. I have I have many pages. I have many <laughs> many pages here. Let me let me show the viewers <laughs> all of these questions I have. Um, <laughs> There was one. Oh, so yeah. So, so the, the Clancy, the Tom Clancy stuff versus mm -hmm. the Matt Drake stuff. Um, you know, the, the thing that we had this funny conversations where, where you and I didn't talk about the Clancy thing until it was done. And yeah. you, you told me that you were afraid I was going to try to talk you out of it. Yes. And, and I, I just think it's a great opportunity. That would not have been my reaction. I, I think it's a great opportunity and you should, you know, lean into it, which you, you are doing all the way. <laughs> but like, like I think that's a big deal to to write two books a year. Not only something that's yours that yeah. is that is really original, and that and you're you're yep. you're touching on your own life, um, and, yep. and also you know the Clancy stuff, which has just this huge life to it. Yeah. I mean, so you know you're you're in you know Mark Rainey territory. You're in Ace Atkins territory. You're in you know Mark mm -hmm. Cameron territory. I mean, this is you, these are big shoes here. 
I know. Thank um, you. Thank you. I'm getting queasier as you're talking. Like, well, I, I, I am a little worried about you. I, you know, but I'm also a little bit, honestly, I'm a little bit in awe of the fact that you're making this work. Um, so, so talk about, about that, both the, the workload, how do you, you know, how are you managing it? Do you just sort of, do you just sort of shut your eyes and, and go kind of what's your, what's your take on that? I have minions and they, they do that. No, I don't have, I wish I had minions. <laughs> we so we no. all wish we had minions. So, so going back to the process stuff where, where you started, what's great about, so my books obviously have to come from me. What's great about the Clancy books is that I have the same editor. So, so Tom Colgan again, and he is very much, um, like the, the, you said you're the, 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 the fount of worthless knowledge. And may I said you're worthless knowledge. Maybe you thought it was important. <laughs> Tom is very much the fount of Clancy knowledge. And so you can and remember you and I and Graham Brown, who writes for Clive Cussler talking once where Graham said, you know, he would go in with Clive Cussler and have eight ideas and, you know, nine of them Clive's like, we did that 23 years ago on book yeah. five and this. And so yeah. Tom is very much like that where you can brainstorm ideas with him and he's got the entire Clancy universe kind of locked into his head and said yes to this, no to this. And, and is also the, like he, he jerked my chain a little bit because the, one of the things when I was writing with Clancy, one of, one of the things that's harder is you have two characters who are kind of similar, but they're different. And there was something I had Jack Ryan do that definitely Matt would have done. And Tom's like, eh, that, that does not, fly, that right. does not fly here. That's not Jack Ryan. He's, he's not going to be able to do that. And so I feel like with Tom, I've got, you know, my training wheels on, or maybe I've got the training wheels and he's running behind the bike, pushing me. <laughs> but the, um, so for, from that standpoint, it helps. It still doesn't, help with um coming up with the overall ideas right where you have two books who are that are in similar universes and and you're trying to come up with two different thriller ideas and what i this time i was able to cheat a little bit because the way the clancy thing worked is we talked about it when i did my editorial call for the outside man which was way back in um and i guess in march february or march last year and so I immediately started working on um, Matt three because we share the same agent. And if you, in fact, our agent, the Barbara Powell once told my friend, Nick Petrie, who wiped his bike out, <laughs> broke his shoulder, had his head cocked halfway like this. Yeah. Surgery, us, painful surgery, he's like painful surgery. And he texts us and he's like, I'm in the ER room right now. And Bill Schweigert and me and Graham Brown, we're like, holy crap, dude, are you all right? And Barbara's text is, how are your hands, Nick? Yeah. Can, Can you, you still type? type? Yeah. And so she's very much of the school of rub some dirt on it and freaking get up and, yeah. and do your job. And so no, she's not. She's no, very, no, very she, yeah, well, she she really is. And there's a lot to be said for that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> rub some dirt on it. I like the rub some she's dirt on it. Texting me right now. No, oh, no, yeah, yeah. No, anyway, yeah. The and so so that was so I when I immediately was writing Matt three because Barbara's like, you gotta write Matt three. And so then when I talked to Tom, the way the timing worked out is I stopped Matt, started Jack Ryan, finished Jack Ryan, and now I'm going back to Matt. And so I'm cheating a little bit this round because I had some Matt stuff to work with. What will get really interesting for me is that um, – so Matt 3 is due like in four months, and then I got to immediately go into the next Clancy one. Yes, yes. And so um, – that is where it'll be my first kind of trial or trial through fire. So maybe come back in July and see if I have any hair left whatsoever. <laughs> and I don't, and now, Barbara, I know if you're watching, she'll say, get up and rub some dirt on it and, and go back to work. But if you're not broken and in surgery like Petrie, I don't want to hear you complain, I think is, is what well, she didn't want, I, I was her. broken. I was in surgery. She didn't want to <laughs> hear me enough. complain. Not, no, not like enough. You should, not enough. You would have taken a hammer and gone wham and just sacrificed that yeah. one hand. Yeah. She would have bought you an extra week. But other than that, you're on yeah. your own. My no, friend. no. She, no. Her, what she was like, if you can't type, we're going to get you on the, on the voice <laughs> typing software. She <laughs> was like, <laughs> you are not getting out of this. It's going to be dictation <laughs> software. Yeah, no, it's pretty funny. Barbara Powell, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, a serious piece of work. Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, what else have we got? Hey, uh, well, let's see. We, um, hey, John, we got anything? Uh, we got any questions from the audience here? We do. We've got a couple. So Ryan wants to know. This is for Don. Uh, why do you write in first person? 
Mm, that's a great question. So that goes back to the same but different stuff. So when I when first of all, one of one of my big influences is, is Nelson DeMille, in particular, particularly his John Corey series, where he has that fantastic. The first one of those books is called Plum Island, and it's this really voicey first person, just hysterical protagonist. And there aren't a whole lot of folks in in this genre who write in first person and not a whole lot of folks who have a similar um, protagonist. And so I'm naturally kind of a jovial guy. And um, I thought, you know, in the when my first two books didn't sell, I thought, you know, I tried to write a book that was much like what everybody else would write. So if I can do this, maybe I should give it a try. And and so I deliberately wrote in first person and wrote Matt that way because that's, you know, a lot of how, number one, how I am. And number two, there weren't a lot of folks who wrote that way. And I thought, you know, if I can, when I got done reading the first John Corey series, I'm like, I, I would read about that guy getting a root canal because he's so funny and it's so much fun to hang out with him. And so maybe if I can do something like that, then readers will feel the same way about Matt. So that's why I did that. So Barbara is watching and she oh, says the oh, shoes... No. She says these shoes don't buy themselves. <laughs> and now and you know. Guys, now you know our worth to her, right? It's one kidding. more pair of Malona Blahniks. Not kidding. Um, so I love this question from Kathy. She says she's read her way through several genres over the pandemic, and she's now working on thrillers. But thrillers can be kind of stressful to read. Why do you think we are attracted to books that stress us out? Let's start with Don. Oh man, I was so hoping you were going to say Nick. I'm like, wow, he'll have a good answer. <laughs> no, I was going to say that's a really good question. That's a really good question. You know, I don't know. I think, I think so. A, a parallel to that question, where a lot of writers have been talking about, is do you include COVID or not in your book? Right? Do you write about that? And I haven't, um, mainly because I'm sick of it, and I don't want to deal with it in my writing because I don't want to deal with it in real life. And so I think. The same way, I think you can, even though it's stressful and it adds tension, you know in the back of your mind it's not real and it's still an escape. And it's, so, so maybe it's kind of like riding the roller coaster, right? So as much as you know that roller coaster is going to freak you out and it's going to be scary, you know at the end of it you're going to come back and everything's going to be safe. And so I think we're, we're maybe willing to escape that way because we like being scared if there's a safety blanket or if there are, you know, if there's there are guide guide rails on either side where you know you're not going to be hurt too bad and and so that's my take now nick say something brilliant <laughs> well i oh, good luck with that um i, I don't know i mean I, I think i think our lives are for for many of us our lives are pretty safe and and the stresses mm -hmm. that we feel are these intangible stresses you know am i am i am i going to get to keep my job i mean that's a real major stress um, you know, COVID is a, a giant source of stress for people, you know, is my, is, you know, I've got a sick kid or I, you know, I mean, like all, all of our lives, mm -hmm. even if they're not super dramatic are filled with stress, especially now, is my wife going to kill me and eat me? Like, right. I, I worry about that someday. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, I think reading something that's a thriller really lets us, you know, in a way kind of translate our the the these these subtle but really serious stresses in our lives into these much more dramatic, exciting and fun stresses. So you get to it's it you're almost sort of uh, you know working through this crap that you've got um, mm -hmm. and and exercising it in a way by 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 reading about somebody running for his life or chasing down the bad guy mm -hmm. or or whatever. Um, I, I also think that that part of the pleasure of crime fiction in general is that. Um, it's a it's a disorderly world that becomes orderly by the end, and and mm -hmm. our you know we we don't know how the end is going to happen in our lives. I mean we we are we're all going to die at least so far, um, but but you know we don't know the ends of our stories, and and we live in a, a life that feels really disorganized, a world that feels really disorganized, especially right now, and so it's also kind of reassuring to especially sort of that traditional mystery novel, a PI novel or a police procedural. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a structure, there's a form and, and you know, and at the end that, you know, that, that good will prevail and that order will be restored. And I think there's a real value to that. And, and it's, I mean, again, part of the fun is to sort of mess with the reader because, you know, if you, if you're really good at it, you know, you don't really know 
you know, you really yeah. don't know if if yeah. if if the you know the good guy will prevail. So I think that's part yeah. of the part of the fun. Yeah. Well, there's also something oh, comforting ahead. about knowing. Um, there's also something comforting about knowing, like, okay, this is stressing me out. I can just put it down and take a break yeah. from it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, well, how much time do we have left here? Um, so we've got a couple more minutes. So I've got um, just a couple more questions here. Oh, yes. So uh, Bill wants to know, Nick, did you know that you were going to be Drake's football coach? <laughs> oh, I did not know that I was going to be two nips Petrie, two nips coach Petrie. Um, <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed it. I actually have not, I, I, I keep thinking about ways to put, cause I've put a couple of friends names in, in various books. Um, Bill uh, was notoriously uh, uh, drunken, you know, uh, Doctor Schweiger, old Doc Schweiger, mm -hmm. who was the old Doc Schweiger. Yeah, the the uh, he, he he lost his license and he was practicing in a very bad neighborhood, kind of fixing up gangbangers. <laughs> um, and uh, and Graham Brown's name sh showed up in the new one. Mm -hmm. um, a slimy but, but, lawyer. Uh, but but I think of you, Don. I, I I really thought that you were just kind of a classier guy. Like I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I, nope. I'd written I'd written a, a character in in the breaker and just sort of a walk on like Coach Petrie who uh, who ran a chain of penis enlargement facilities and I thought about using your name for that but I didn't because I just you know because because I am because I I thought more highly of you but but yeah, oh so gosh. I just I gotta find the right the right place <sighs> but aren't you glad I didn't. <laughs> I am very glad and surprised, pleasantly surprised, actually. So it's actually my neighbor. I put, I made, I gave my neighbor that job. Nick, your video is is paused, so I'm going to remove you from the stream and drop you back in real quick and see if that resets your video. All right. Okay. No, it didn't. We can hear you fine. Your video All is right. just frozen. Um, All right. Okay. So this is. I think this will be our last question. So this is for both of you. Brian wants to know. Um, have you mapped out your series or do you have kind of a, an idea of where things are going to go in advance or are you kind of making it up from the book? I'll answer first. Um, Brian, I don't have a stinking clue. My friend <laughs> don't have a clue. That's what I got for you. Yeah. I, I, I'm with, I'm with Don. I am always amazed at the people who are like, Oh yes, I have, I've, I have the, I've had the arc of the next seven books. And it's like, I'm like, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't like, if you think you do, you don't, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm half. Oh, have I lost you both now? No, no, no we can still, still hear you. Oh, I'm, I'm half reacting to um, the, the previous book in terms of sort of trying to do something different from that. Um, and also I'm just trying to scratch whatever, whatever itch I've got in, in the world. You know, if, if the last book was very urban, I try to do the next one. That's a little more rural. Um, you know, I, I try to, I try to have different kinds of characters, but that's as far as I get. And I, I agree with Nick, but here's kind of our guiding principle, Bar uh, Brian, Barbara's shoes do not buy themselves. Yeah. So <laughs> we got to come up with something. Yeah. All right. So on that note, to wrap us up this evening, oh wait, Nick's moving again. So <laughs> yay! Um, so to wrap us up this evening, we've been chatting with Don Bentley, whose new Matt Drake book, um, The Outside Man, just came out Tuesday. We have signed book plates for it. Uh, Nick Petrie's book, The Breaker, came out in January. We have signed book plates for it as well. I'll hold up. up there we go. Um, so if you need either of them, if you want to start with first books in the series, we've got those, um, without sanction is the first of the Matt Drake books and the drifter is the first of the Peter Ash books. We've got all of those in store. We have book plates for those as well. If you missed any part of the event and you want to rewatch it, once we're done, Facebook and YouTube will archive them. Sometimes YouTube takes just a little bit longer to get all the encoding stuff done. Uh, if you want to check out the event that we did with Nick for The Drifter, um, I dropped links in the chat here so you can check that out. And also while you're playing around on the, st uh, the store's YouTube or Facebook videos, definitely check out all of the other author events that we've had uh, through there. I already that's a, mentioned- That's a great library of stuff. Yeah, I'm so I'm super excited to see once we're able to like actually host in-store stuff again, how we can still do some virtual stuff like this because it's it's been really fun. It's been really nice to yeah. see like a couple of weeks later to see people discovering things like that. Or if somebody comes in and they buy a copy of the new book, hey, if you like this, you can go hear the author talk about it right now. So it's been really cool. cool. 
Um, so thank you gentlemen so much for joining us this evening. Nick, thank you for, for uh, arranging or agreeing to, to harass Don a little bit for us. <laughs> I thought I thought I went really easy on yeah. you. I feel like I did not. I didn't even ask my best question. And, and, oh my gosh! Here. So here's my best question. All right, and this this came. So we we have a really deep thinker. Um, he, he, this this is somebody sent this to me. Uh, now wait, I have to find the question because I really I've really got it. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah. So we have a noted a noted public intellectual. Uh, and one of our truly deep thinkers, a guy named Bill Schweiger, as you know. Oh, no. um, so, so, and, and please be honest. This is a safe space, right? You can, you know, your answer is probably not really being recorded for all time. So here is the question. Have you ever had a supernatural encounter? And on a scale of one to 10, exactly how sexy was it? So that's, I think, I think that's a good note to end on, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it could. Oh, we, it might. It might be that we're just cutting right off. Is that really going to happen? Oh God! I, well, someone will have to ask that question again at some point. Definitely. <laughs> well, thanks for having us, John. Thanks, thanks John. so much. Much appreciated. Y'all have a good night. We'll see you soon. You too. Nice right, to see, see you, you later. Bye.